please. Welcome, friends, to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's Noons at the Athenaeum series. We are so delighted to have you with us again for our regular noontime lunch and learn. It's great to have you here. I'm Beth Hessel, the executive director. You see on screen also Tess Galen and our longtime member and friend Ed Jackma, who's going to treat us with a talk about Jim Sterling, the first of two. Tess, I believe the second uh, part of this will be January 11th at noon. So after this, go online and register for the next one and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation. If you don't know Ed, you will wish that you did. He is uh, a kind and generous uh, individual who is one of our very uh, important members of our building committee here at, at the Athenaeum, helping us to keep our National Historic Landmark building in one piece and in good shape. So we're so grateful to Ed. Today he's gonna talk with us and uh, Ed is uh, an architect and urbanist who is based here in Philadelphia. He's an emeritus principal at Ballinger and uh, which uh, is the oldest architecture and engineering firm in the US. He has spoken on urbanism and planning all over the world. And um, as we talk about Jim Sterling today, he actually met him back in 1964 and toured the Leicester Engineering Building with him. Ed has degrees from Rensselaer and Harvard. He was a Fulbright Fellow in Regional Planning at LSE, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and he brings all of that to bear today. So I invite all of you to join us in providing Ed Jackma a warm welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Welcome. It's a little uh, daunting to be speaking for the first time in this 1814 building. Uh, I'm going to do a few shout outs. Very big thanks to Athenaeum librarian Jill Lee. There are over uh, 25 pretty thick books on James Sterling and his partners. And there are a lot of uh, magazine and journal articles. And uh, Jill was uh, awesome, world class in tracking them down for me. Another quick thanks goes to Chris Gray. He's a colleague from Ballinger, a teacher, a former teacher and uh, knew quite a bit about Jim Sterling. So he gave me a few insights which are being passed on to you. Um, I'm, I'm speaking on a very crisp, lovely 65 degree Fahrenheit sunny day from Washington Square, which I want to toss out some numbers to you. 400 feet by 400 feet for the green planted area. So some of you can keep that picture in mind. It'll come into play when we discuss a complicated project Jim Sterling <clears throat> and Michael Walford, Walford did for Runcorn. So on the screen, you should see a drawing of Jim. Um, he was always a bit on the heavy side. That will come to play in part two when he dies a bit prematurely. It's a drawing by Leon Cryer, who was uh, in his office um, as a, on an Austrian, I believe, and uh, some say influenced Jim to more towards historicism. That'll come out to play in part two. And I want to emphasize in these talks about individual architects, architecture is a very collaborative process. It can be an art, but it's also a business. It's an engineering effort. And uh, Jim was really no exception. He loved technology. He, I believe, liked engineering. I'll make some comments of that on specific projects. But he did have partners all the way along. James Gowan is a true Scot. Uh, he was born in Scotland and went to school at the Glasgow School of Art. So there's James Gowan, his partner for um, six or eight years. Michael Walford came on to help with Leicester Engineering as a technical lead and Michael became his long-term partner. Jim, to give you a heads up, what was he concerned about? What was his interests? What are characteristics of his buildings? Well, he paid a lot of attention to program. He would frequently just talk about program. He would not talk about architectural theory. He used glass. He loved vernacular references. Structure was often expressed. There was often historic reference, whether you were aware of it or not. I find a lot of wit in his buildings. And uh, Chris Gray's insight 
alerted me to social spaces. He's very good at having social spaces, ramps, terraces, loges, plazas, as a place where people can um, commingle. Uh, color, he was very innovative in use of color in modern buildings. Uh, some of you, uh, probably overeducated people, know the Greek temples, we see them all as white, but those friezes were painted in brilliant colors before nature took its course. Jim also was fascinated by prefabrication and movement in buildings. So it's a long list of 11 things, but keep them in mind as you see, we go through his personal life as well as building life. So um, Jim, uh, he would claim sometimes he was of a horribly poor slum neighborhood. I hate to use that word slum. Let's say rundown neighborhood, that's not true. His um, mom, Louise Fraser, um, and uh, his dad, J Joseph Sterling, lived in a very elegant quality tenement. Tenement didn't have a dirty word then. 12, 13 foot ceilings that are all around Glasgow. And Jim uh, uh, was um, born, came into the world there, it's my understanding, with a midwife. And um, that he was there for about a year before they moved to, from Glasgow to Liverpool. Uh, this house with the pin, it looks a little like a Chestnut Hill or Mount Airy in Philadelphia twin. Also, it's in Liverpool. Uh, and they moved there. Um, let's see. His, his mom was a school teacher and his dad was a ship engineer who worked his way up uh, in the blue line. I'll say a little more, a blue funnel line. So Jim always was near water and very uh, amenable to shipping and trade. Um, some of you may know better than I, Liverpool was really the New York of uh, England. It was a major port for emigration. And uh, both the River Clyde where um, Glasgow is and the Mercy River or Mercy Inlet uh, Jim was always near the water there. Um, Liverpool um, in 05, at about a little before the time Jim um, came there, was had 700,000 people in it. So, um, as we said, he, he was born in Scotland. There's debate over the birth year, 23, 24. He felt, you will hear more of this, he felt he lost some time in service and school. Um, so he, uh, he reduced his age by saying he was 26. But I have it on the best uh, authorities. He was closer to being born in early 24. Now, what do we know about Jim uh, and his family uh, himself? Uh, he had one sister, Una. I could not track down anything about what Una's been up to. Uh, Jim was an early birder, and you see him in that blazer at his school, Quarry Bank Secondary School. It's a very progressive, free state school, which Jim started there in 36. Other uh, notables from Quarry Bank were uh, some who are very sharp. We'll see John Lennon in the lower left. And uh, this, this guy is uh, Bill Rogers, uh, a, a social Democrat leader with Roy Jenkins. Some of you may remember these people. And here's some pictures of Quarry Bank. It looks like an attractive campus. And I've just heard very positive things about the school. They had a new headmaster when Jim was there. It's very progressive. Now in Liverpool, uh, Jim's outdoor play area were the fabulous docks um, that are all around the water. Very robust, beautiful buildings. And also very progressive, uh, lots of glass buildings by Peter Ellis. Uh, this will come to play out with some of Jim's girlfriends, which I'm gonna report on. Uh, my grandson thought that was the most interesting part of the talk. Jim lived at home all during grammar school and all through architecture school with his mom uh, feeding him and doing his laundry. Um, what else do we know about the dad? Well, the blue funnel line, it's not one that everyone knows about, but it was just as important as the White Star Line and the Cunard Line. Um, 23 people on the Titanic uh, lost their lives uh, when it went down. 
the Titanic was registered in Liverpool. So there is a memorial to the Titanic engineers. And um, the, the Blue Funnel Line went all over the world. So Jim's dad was away a great deal of the time. I, I couldn't venture to say he, he was raised by a single parent, but it almost came to that. Uh, his dad brought home uh, pink and blue uh, engineering drawings. This is a sort of facsimile, but Jim was fascinated by the different colors. That may have awakened in him the interest in color. Um, this is the Lime Street station roof. I believe it's still up in Liverpool. And uh, some people have made comparisons to some of Jim's glass roofs, particularly at Cambridge, as a, a redolent um, a reference to Lime Street. Uh, Liverpool's always had a very strong soccer team. I'm not, a, Jim didn't do sports. He was a good birder. Um, these are the, some close-ups. He was called back later, and I'll show you, I think it's in part two. Well, no, it's maybe in part one. He was called back to do a very large addition for the Tate in the North all these floors here on the wonderful Jeff Harvey docks. And he was always aware of this um, building with the curved glass or it's segmented glass by um, um, Oriel Chambers from 1864. Uh, the backs of buildings by Peter Ellis um, were well known to Jim. They're in his notebooks, things that appear later in his buildings. There's a shot of Oriel Chambers at night. Certainly you'll see pictures later of some of Jim's buildings, um, Leicester and Cambridge glowing like that. You will see some of these cranes and things on the roof of his buildings. So from being a rather ordinary student at uh, secondary school, he enrolled in the Liverpool, Start, the Liverpool School of Art in 1941, thinking he would go into art. He was only there a year and uh, the war was on. And so he enlisted and was persuaded to be in the Royal Paratroopers. Now, um, while he was in service in training, there were parties for the officers. He was a lieutenant uh, at the Macintosh building uh, in uh, Glasgow. So Jim was familiar with this firsthand. I, I, I don't think he was a really heavy drinker, but there were parties. That, students would be sitting and making out on the steps. I want to tell you, um, he's very proud he landed on D-Day. I want to, and I want to tell you this is Jim, but I have no evidence of that. But um, he's very proud of his service. He was injured severely and had a handicap in his left hand and arm for his whole life. He got a disability pension for that, probably kept him in good wine for his whole life. Now, he had to re recab at Harwood House, curiously designed by Scott, one of the Adams brothers, and this was filled with beds. So picture some of the Downton Abbey rooms filled with beds. I presume the art was removed for safety, but it was here looking up at the ceiling that Jim decided he would pursue architecture. And Liverpool at the time was, uh, one of, if not the strongest uh, architecture schools um, besides the AA in London. And it was, of course, right there in his hometown. So uh, some of his classes were in the Victorian building. Uh, most were probably in a much, much less imposing building. But um, doing this sort of biography in architecture, I, I learned that Liverpool was we coined the term red brick as opposed to the stone of Oxford and Cambridge, where Jim would soon be doing buildings. There was a school within the school. Uh, the Polish refugee faculty and students fleeing Hitler were housed in the school with their own rigorous, the purest of modernism, including the white building. So in addition to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was the tradition of Liverpool then, um, Jim was exposed in the crits and he could go to lectures if he wanted to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So for those of you who uh, most probably know Philadelphia very well, it's amazing that uh, in 1928, uh, Trumbauer with Julian Abel uh, were doing the museum with the bottom, uh, middle, and the top. 
and Le Corbusier one year later was building the Villa Savoy, which is a severe white building, the pure whites that the Poles endorsed. Curiously, if you look carefully, it has its own bottom, which is very open, a middle and a top. So Jim absorbed, he was like a sponge for architecture and he had a very good library. He loved books. He uh, was one of um, two or three students selected to go to the US in his fourth year. And he did his thesis while he was in New York. And uh, those of you who have been to New Canaan, there's some Breuer houses there very much like this, up on Pelotes or Sticks, and then they have a, a box on the top. Uh, Jim's other thesis, I think, was a Civic Center, um, very much in the Le Corbusier manner. Pelotes lifting it up, heavy, robust feet. Um, very, pretty sophisticated for a student. I mean, things were getting built not as good as this by older practicing architects. Uh, what did Jim see on his tour to the US? Well, uh, Philadelphia was not left out. He was very taken with the Howe and Lascaz 1932 PSFS building. This is in a rare photo with um, the Mummers coming down Market Street. This, this bottom two thirds of the building is now blocked by other buildings, but uh, this was a building, you know, 10 or 20 years old. I believe it's the first air conditioning tall building in the US. He got out to the West Coast. Well, he, he went through Wisconsin and saw uh, Wright's Johnson Wax Tower. Keep this in mind when we see Leicester. It has uh, rather expensive curved glass corners, and those will become chamfered, uh, not as fussy in um, Jim's work. He got to the Eames house, which uh, Ray and Charles Eames, they're the famous furniture designers. Um, built with a double height, but not too big living room. He's very taken with that. This is all component, component parts put together. And I, I, my research tells me he got out to San Francisco and saw the Hillady building. It was a glass curtain wall with stairs on the outside. Uh, at the same time, when he got back, um, he was familiar with Asplund, his famous 1928 Stockholm library, and he made more than one trip there um, after he finished school and was in London. Now, as in the States, and I, well, as in the UK and the States, in most places, you have to go out and work in a recognized office for a couple of years before you can sit for your exams. So he bounced around a bit, he was a bit fussy, he took some planning courses, he didn't care for them, but there's a firm, LIE, Lions Israel Ellis, was a very reputable, and now has a, a great person with them. But they were doing, uh, and this is more contemporary work, progressive work expressing functions of this auditorium lecture hall. So um, he hit it off quite well there. Uh, they like him and he liked them back. Um, so when he was back working in London, he, he made further trips. His notebooks have um, sketches of this um, Pojanhout Hotel in Finland. He saw the, uh, let's see, is that the vanilla chocolate plant, the Boots factory, Le Corbusier Cité du Refuge. And you'll see these bright colors appearing in Jim's work. I think I got to the bar house until the time, but the Kew Gardens was still up and his partner, shortly to be his partner, uh, James Gallon, it was his favorite building, 1844 Burton. Now, the gym was a, a healthy, uh, striking dude in his late twenties and early thirties. Um, he had several, uh, serious serial monogamous relationships with girlfriends and they they all uh, they lasted one to three years uh some of you know jacob bakama well this is his daughter brita she did this work which i think is very sterling-esque and picasso-ish very bright colors he has a philadelphia connection jim in that at, as when he was teaching at yale in this early time in the, before he had his practice he met Barbara Chase, and uh, they were an item for a couple of years. 
Barbara is still alive and appeared in the Enquirer this year. Uh, she spoke at his service with several other girlfriends, very affectionately and positively. So he didn't he didn't burn his bridges with his girlfriend. You will see more about that. Um, Barbara said in some interesting notes, the biographer uncovered, um, she broke off the relationship. Jim was too much work. He, I don't know if he expected his girlfriends to do his laundry and feed him all the time the way his mom had. But Barbara married a very um, distinguished photographer, Mark Ribot. And her name is there. He, he was from Magnum. That's kind of the go-to, maybe still was then the go-to photography outfit. So Barbara's biggest claim, uh, most of Jim's friends were lefties. She did the uh, Sally Hemings book, the first one, and um, was very well received in the Times, um, exploring the stuff that's becoming more common now, biraciality, how common it is. And um, Steven Spielberg um, apparently had appropriated the rights to this a bit unethically, so she got $20 million from Stephen out of court settlement for the book, and the book did quite well. Now, another girlfriend was uh, Janet Kay. Um, she's a very distinguished landscape architect who worked on, among other things, the Alexander Road rehab in London. This is a very picturesque thing. It's often in British uh, crime thrillers, there's people running on these terraces. And um, Janet Kay had Vesper, and Jim would frequently be on the back. He wasn't as huge, his huge big self then, but it was, it was still quite a big load. But they were very noted to be going here and there around London. Um, now this girlfriend, Aldred Evans, is still alive. She was helped, she was Jim's student at the uh, AA, and he helped her win a competition. And with the proceeds, she bought this used Rolls Royce. You can see, if you're very good eyes, you can see um, Eldred in the driver's seat. And she recently, uh, in the last few decades, did the Tate in the South at St. Saint, uh, Saint Ives. Uh, when I was in architecture school, it was an all boys class at Rensselaer. And I was told, if you want to be a great architect, um, successful great architect. You either got to be a genius or, or marry a rich woman. There were no women in the class at that time. There were later, but not in the first year. So she did marry a, a man, not poor, but rich. He's connected with the uh, Teva Pharmaceutical Company. It's very prosperous, based in Israel. Uh, this car, unlike the Vespa, would be loaned to Jim for almost a decade. Now, Jim is uh, working in LIE, and one of his uh, students at the AA, the dad, um, gives him a commission for some flats, houses. And on the basis of this, I'll go back to that for a minute. On the basis of this, he sets up a practice with James Gowan. Um, at the time, what was prevailing in London was the buildings like the Royal Festival Hall from 1951 by Robert Matthew and Leslie Martin. And Jim was among the many architects who didn't care for this sort of heavy handed white work. Vanilla architecture, he thought it was. He was more interested in what you're going to see now for the next 23 minutes. The three universities which I'm referring to, uh, not originally, but the Red Brick Trilogy, plus one. The plus one is Salwyn, which wasn't built, but we'll, we'll look at what it was. You're also going to see his interest in prefabrication and social housing at Runcorn, Newtown, and Peru. And then you're going to see medium tech prefabs at St. Andrews and Olivetti. So that's a little overview of part one. And here's some pictures of them, just to be prime your memory. So you're going to see the red brick and tile at Leicester, at Cambridge, and at Oxford. Uh, behind these pictures here is the back of this thing. It looks a bit like Noah's Ark. You're going to see the prefab 
concrete at St. Andrews, and you'll see prefabrication at um, Runcon and prefabrication at Olivetti. So here comes Lester. This was given to him by Sir Leslie Martin, the guy who was involved in um, the planning of the campus and also the um, Royal Festival Hall you just saw. And this is going to uh, send Jim and his partner off in a rocket. Now, how do I know Jim? Well, I was um, given a letter by the dean at Rensselaer to invite Jim to come and teach at Rensselaer. And I, um, I brought the letter in on a Tuesday and one or two days later to my flat at Cambridge Terrace overlooking Regent's Park, this letter came even telling me there was which train to take. Uh, Jim had told me in the office that he was getting his new first car, an Alfa Romeo, Romeo convertible, that he would give, have given me a ride when he was picking up the car, so I should take the train. Now, I wondered, uh, did he have dissolved the office after it was split up with um, his partner, Jim Scotland. So it was a very tiny three or four architects working one or two assistants. So this letter is by Mary Bannon, as best I can. This is the wife of Raina Bannon, who had put out the book in 1960, Theory and Design in the First Machine. So it's all very interconnected. So I did take the train and arrived at 11.38, and I met Jim at the entrance ramp. Uh, the site was essentially a backyard. And uh, they thought they were a little nervous of him, you know, he's just 30, 35 now. And, uh, but it had a wonderful view over Victoria Park. So um, Jim was actually teaching at Yale uh, when the early concepts were being developed, but he collaborated very, very closely with Gowan. I would say it's 50-50 collaboration, very successful. He articulated the lab block and the offices and the workshops. So the early components, and then they kind of fine-tuned it. Architecture does get better when you work at it. And um, you'll see the corners are right angles. They're not chamfered yet. And there's a sense of the ramp movement coming into play. So here are the parts. When you see the very photogenic pictures, the water tanks on the top was 100 foot up in the air requirement for the pressure offices. Um, lovely detailing of the structure being expressed at this chamfer now. Large lecture hall express, the small lecture hall express, a ramp and a terrace podium as a social space. So those were the, some of the things you, you were looking for, social spaces, articulation of elements. Uh, Jim would usually present things totally functionally. Um, by the way, he, he published all his books in Germany, and he had a lot of work in Germany later. Um, why, I don't know. Uh, but he would explain the buildings very much, almost like engineering diagrams, you know, like water flowing through the building, but these are the student flows, north light. So here we see it coming all together, the water tanks up 100 feet the offices, the lecture halls, the stairs getting smaller as it goes up because there was less traffic. And uh, a little overly red by my filtering, but um, there's the, the workshops and the offices, the chamfered structure express, the social terrace. Influences, Liverpool backs, backs to buildings in Liverpool, uh, Moscow, the famous Konstantin Melnikov Russian Workers' Club. This was all in white concrete. So Jim was probably aware of these uh, Russian things, Moscow things from books. So uh, some have said this was like uh, on an ocean with waves coming, but these people using the social terraces. Uh, this was a requirement from a professor who didn't want latecomers interrupting his class, so they were to come in at the back. Very neatly put in at the back, rather sculptural. Here it is tucked in. Uh, kind of Alto-esque interiors, by the way, he was familiar with the work of Alto. And um, when it first opened, um, you can just picture this early lab with wood uh, black tops. 
And today, um, updated with people wearing uh, that certain look of white shoes and so on. Still going strong. So he's put on a stamp and international pain followed. Now, about this time, he's settling down and he uh, is dating Mary Shand and they marry. And he, this is long-term married partner and they have three children. We'll see them in a minute. Um, so this is all happening while Lester is being a success. And there's a very photogenic picture. It's very hard not to take a, a photogenic picture if the sun is out. Now keep in mind, where is Leicester? It's way up there in the Midlands, you know, um, not quite where Toronto is. Uh, Liverpool is Toronto. So we're further north and it's gonna be colder and grayer. The, the sea air will temper it so it doesn't get as cold as in the US, but it's pretty far north. There's the big auditorium and the small one and uh, the other things you've heard about. Now, um, this is an allusion to Le Corbusier's photos, but Jim often borrowed Eldred Evans' rolls. And here is a famous picture of it behind the building in the service yard. Now, along this time, he entered the competition for Salwyn College, some 200 apartments. It was a very tight site. So he kind of this necklace of glass. This is an Aunt Jack quote here, a crystalline necklace for living overlooking a garden. And um, here's a blow up I did for your and my understanding. So he's got all the service elements, the kitchen and the lift or elevator. It's much easier for me to use the word lift than elevator. Labeling these, the, the toilet and the bath. Very short, um, short distances from the elevator or stair to the uh, apartments. And these are the individual student study apartments. So um, very um, distilled out concept that he has of, you could call them in Lucan terminology, the servant areas and the served. Some people say to me, is, is this still influencing people? And I'm very happy in Philadelphia to say it's Norman Foster did it on his um, Comcast Innovation Center where the, the elevators are on the west side exposed. Um, if you look carefully, you can see them going up and down. The actual lobby is where the lights are. So 71 years later, some of Jim's early ideas, and he wasn't the only one to have those, are going strong. So about this time too, he, he buys a twin house, not unlike his Liverpool house, where he lived his whole life in Belsize Park and had a nice garden and it was on the end, so there were windows on the side. And here he is with the three children. Um, Jim is here with Ben, Kate, and Sophie um, climbing on him. Now, uh, he is lucky enough to win the competition at Cambridge for um, the library. I'm gonna go a little faster now, but you're ramped up so you know what you're looking for. Um, this was the existing library. You can bet that the Dons didn't care too much moving into a modern building. This is the Col des Beaux-Arts building. Uh, it, the library site was, uh, to my knowledge, just grass and parking, so there was no context. He was the only entrant of the final six to have a central control desk that monitored the students coming in as well as the visibility of all the stacks. And um, as an entry ramp, like Lester, you can see a law library that Foster did in the distance. Jim is up in the roof. And the big feature here was how do we control heat and cold here? Well, he had double glazing, but it was this pattern glazing. It's almost like shingles of glass. It's not like thick glazing and gaskets. And he had an exhaust fan up at the top which was in bright colors, but it was too noisy and was discontinued, causing uh, havoc with heating and cooling. Uh, here's a shot inside, a very dramatic space, and you can see the librarian is looking into the stacks and controlling it. Um, 
precedent for this, Otto Wagner in Vienna, a fabulous um, post office bank where there was not only a glass ceiling held on tension cables, it was a big double line ceiling, but glass floor. And you will see these air handler units, quite amazing for 1914, all this stuff being expressed. Few shots inside the library. Um, and uh, Charles Jenks, who was uh, an American who went for his career in Britain, had a lot of degrees. He called this the finest modern interior in Britain. Now that may have been when it opened, 64 or five. There were stairs to go up, which caused the librarians to be upset. I would have solved that with a little lift here, but I don't think anyone has yet. Now about this time too, he's called to Scotland to do uh, residence halls. I'm gonna have to go extra fast to keep to the time, but um, uh, St. Andrews is about an hour and a half north of, um, of uh, Edinburgh and there's very little skilled labor. So um, with permission and he gets the okay to do concrete. And I should have mentioned that at, at Leicester, the uh, building committee said, we do not want concrete, it gets dirty right away. We don't have the staff to keep it clean. Um, St. Andrew said, we're cleaner in the north here, you can use concrete. So Jim did embark on um, these necklaces overlooking the sea. He was gonna be four of these, each at 200, 250, but only the first phase got built. Some gray, here you can see the little crane with the prefab units. Uh, concrete's very good between the walls as for acoustics. Is a very thoughtful solution. It is the most popular uh, student residence uh, for St. Andrews and it's among the top buildings. You can see it's kind of dirtyish, not really over the top, but it's very hard to keep concrete clean unless you steam clean it every few years. A little like a battleship. You come in up at grade, I think there's a shot here. Yes, you come, you just see this and the North Sea is off beyond. And then you come and come down the stairs and you have a lovely view out. Um, Mary, um, I, I finally got to commend, Mary's a very talented, his wife, uh, Mary Shand, Mrs. Sterling did the interiors and they're very good chairs. I think these went into a successful production. There's the glass center and this is the level which you circulate at. Uh, the dorm rooms are very good. They had uh, lights from two windows and ventilation. So you get through ventilation in these units. Units are small in England, smaller than US units. And uh, there's a reference here to some Art Nouveau deco in the Czech Republic. So here's a shot today. Uh, it's passably clean and so on. And, a lot of his buildings had to be remediated with better glass and flashing, but they have been corrected. Now, um, Oxford wants a Jim Sterling building. So um, Dr. Floor, Professor Floyd, who will gain fame with um, distributing penicillin is the provost at Queens. Now Queens is over here, number 11. And he's given a rather back in the woods site over here, but he takes advantage of this site with a view to Maudlin Tower um, from um, three quarters, two thirds of the rooms. And a lot of his presentation diagrams stress that tower goes back to 1509. Uh, model, publications, some of the things you see, the, the fellows are at the top with the lovely double height rooms. I'll show you, they have exposure on both sides. Reference to alto stairs at MIT from 57, which Jim saw. Uh, you see robust structure expressed. Um, his famous lovely line drawings. And um, he had asked for a block, um, 
eight inch block between the walls and then that was turned down four inch block and they ended up with drywall and plaster and that didn't work. So the acoustics have not been its forte at this point. He also paved the plaza in a brick um, to be more democratic because if it's green uh, grass, the only the dons at the colleges can walk on the grass. He wanted to be more democratic. Here's a nice diagram showing the east and west light in the fellows rooms. And the corridor had these uh, laybys or social spaces for socializing, cooking, studying, um, and the express service theater, almost exactly like that at Selwyn. This is also the number one choice. They have to do a lottery for this building for the Queens um, students that are eligible to live there. They get the three years in college three instead of four, um, three shots to get in the building. Uh, his, one, his, his bright green colors were there. You see the paving is still there and the lovely breakfast multi-purpose room, all looking out over this tributary to the River Thames. Uh, so this flex room can be lecture or a refectory. Um, I'm going to just let your eyes take these things in. You can see the robust structure expressed. Someone critic said here, it was almost like a zoomorphic animal that had settled down by the river. And cloisters, the cloisters have precedent. You, you lift the building up. Um, there were cloisters at Cambridge going back to the 16th century and there were cloisters at Queens. Here they are very perfect because everyone's bicycling. Now it's uh, been paved with grass so you've planted with grass. It looks like it's still in need of maintenance there with the brickwork. Um, but it, it's a secluded, tranquil riverside world for the privileged few, those smart enough and lucky enough to live there. Norman Foster, I don't know if Norman applied to Cambridge, uh, we couldn't get in. Uh, here's a shot with Her Majesty visiting for the opening and these uh, palm trees a little big at the Empire put in the office, it's in one of his books. Now he gets a commission to go to Runcon, which is near Liverpool. Uh, to do 6,000 um, housing for 6,000 people. Runcorn is here um, on the River Mercy, the Mercy Vale or Mercy Valley, not far from Manchester. So this is one of the areas where the British government in the Labour government started out wanting to rejuvenate for better and affordable housing. He, he, the brief said, we want to create squares like uh, Bloomsbury Square and Bedford Square and Soho Square. These squares were of, of the dimension across was uh, often 300 feet. I told you the Washington Square, the green planted area of Washington Square is 400 square feet. So he took that to heart. He didn't do a crescent, but these the precedents in Bath were 300 foot squares, 1864, 100 years earlier. And he did a lot of options and the option 16 was selected and it had, I think, 13 or 14 of these squares with some double squares and some open squares. And uh, they had um, traffic on one side and then open to the squares on the other without traffic. Now in Bath, these squares are rather austere and they're used to it. So there was that precedent, the, the, you know, the, the ones in the city of London are uh, brick often are friendlier. But the Bath Square itself is you, fabulous trees in it, like Washington Square. So here's some drawings of it. Um, it got planted. Um, it doesn't look really as upscale as Society Hill, but it, it was for limited income people. And he, Jim had this nautical idea with these portholes that would be redolent of the ship industry, which many people had people in the family remember, but instead they took up and compared them to washing machines. So it's a little uh, humorous to see this looks like a washing machine door and there's the laundry outside, particularly on the phase two. Now phase two was entirely done in um, glass reinforced panels. Um, the first part phase had a lot of concrete in it. It had these covered walkways. You see a wedding couple coming down here. 
And there were a lot of children. And when the children became teenagers, uh, they became rambunctious. People complained in phase one, the walkways were too noisy and made noise into the dining area. The bedrooms would have been upstairs. This upstairs thing would have been on top of this one. So in phase two, all these things were addressed through gardens and car parking as a buffer zone to keep the quiet down. And the living rooms, there were various options with the bedrooms upstairs. So you had a buffer zone of a sidewalk and um, about half the development was built in phase two. And it had small visible play areas. Um, trees matured, but I think Thatcher had it in for this and she cut back on the services in the early seventies, the fuel oil crises, the heating was expensive. And after only 15 years, it was all torn down. And this is what they put up. Um, the rents were high, the heating costs were high. Uh, so-called stable good families couldn't afford it and moved out and less desirable families moved in. So Runcon is gone forever and is now this. Now, at the same time, I'll rush through this. Jim did a competition for low income housing, you know, the favelas solution in Lima, Peru. It's a painting we picked up when we were visiting. And uh, this is like high density, low rise. But the thing here is that the, the government would start with a basic L shape and then you could add on rooms and bedrooms as, you're, as you prospered or thrived. And um, here you could change the facades, which you couldn't do at Runcon, which was annoying to some people. So you could add bedrooms. You start with the L shape and add upper floor bedrooms and add a little arcade if you wanted. Um, this did not go anywhere. There was a demo mock-up made, but it stayed as a concept. Now, someone who did build there was someone you can look up on YouTube, Alejandro Arvina. He's done these all over the place. So you start out with the basic thing and a space to build in, and then everyone fills in their own version of it. And these have been quite successful. He's done a couple of dozen of these in different variations. So in the home stretch here, we have a three or four minutes. Jim, I uh, said he was preoccupied with um, prefabrication. He gets a commission from Olivetti, sort of the mini IBM, mini Apple of the day, um, to do an addition to a, a little townhouse or country house. And he does this kind of amazing thing where the roof becomes the wall. It's on a lovely estate, growth linearly at the ends. Um, bright colors, redolent of the docks, the zinc colored docks at Liverpool. A lovely glass arcade, the first time this sort of had been done, the ramp. Bright colors, you see the vertical radiators, again, reminiscent of what Arvo Wagner did in 1904. And you see the wall and the roof being all one thing. Again, uh, this was a IBM product designed by Mario Bellini and the, the building is a redolent of this. If I did have one of these, I don't have one. It's a lovely squishy thing to press on. So there's Jim and the explanation of how the panels go together with a filler, yeah, filler and then the caulking. Uh, this is still in good use. It's now a private um, conference center. So there you have seen part one uh, you've seen Leicester, Cambridge, Oxford, St. Andrews, Runcon, Olivetti, and you saw something in Peru. Jim is getting quite famous now. And um, part two, to do a pitch for that, um, Tuesday, January 11th, I believe also at noon, we'll have the transition phase for the German uh, State Gallery, the Stats Gallery in Stuttgart. We have three or four projects there, and we'll look at the work in the US at Harvard, Rice, Columbia, Cornell, and UC Irvine. We'll see the Tate in the North. We'll see a big project in Melsingen, Germany, and we'll wrap up with the, his last project, the Electra Bookshop, Venice. So I think that is the end for today.
Well, Thank you, Ed. We have a few minutes here for questions. If you want to put them in the Q&A or the chat, love to get your questions and we'll um, share them with Ed and he's looking forward to answering them as well. And if you don't have any questions, I'll tell you more things. Ed, do you have, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, um, do you have any is, is, do you have one of those buildings that's your favorite building? Um, I'm along with most people that the, the Leicester building to me was, it was just like nothing like it before. Um, a very a pragmatic approach to the sculptural insertions of things. Um, I think the client was on board for that because it, 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 rather than, you know, create a box and put all those things in it, he articulated each element. So he kind of went as far as you could go with that. But I will have to say that I'm always torn. I've been to the Flory dormitories twice. Uh, every, anytime I'm anywhere not near Oxford or even in London, I take the train right in. The three red bricks are my very big favorites. But, um, the other little filler, I'm very, very fond of what he did for the fog on the Harvard campus. It has the um, now verboten name Sackler still on the door, but he had the, the School of Architecture at Harvard next to him in the back. He had the Neo-Georgian fog building on the one side, which he was supposed to connect to, and that's quite an interesting story how he was gonna connect. So, uh, I'm going to say I'm voting for the three red bricks as a work of music, sort of. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to have a few favorites, uh, probably the fog, which is, um, it's not really postmodern, it's not really traditional, it's very creative. Thank you. Um, Katerina is wondering, she said you mentioned uh, the, that you find wit in Sterling's humor and wondering if you could share an example or two. Well, all right, wit and humor. To me, work, yes. Uh, yes, this gets a little serious answer to it. To me, if you go on a ramp, it's a very celebratory uplifting thing. You're going on a ramp, you know, little children love to run up ramps. Um, the fact that Jim had a handicap, I think he, he never mentioned it. Um, but he, he could, he had very little use of his left hand and arm. He's fortunately right-handed. So the ramps are an early ADA thing and uh, he put them in. What reasons he gave, I don't know. I don't think it would have been for wheelchairs. They, they may be a little steep for wheelchairs. They're not to today's ADA. So I think the ramps are playful. I think that, um, that glass cylinder coming out of the lecture hall is rather playful, you know, but it goes back to those backs we saw. Liverpool. Um, let's see. I think the the person who said it might have been Richard McCormick uh, that the Flory dorms look like a giant zoomorphic animal had decided to sit on the river and look out. I find it curiously uh, like an, a toy. All his buildings are smaller than you think, so they have a toy-like quality. Um, I think also when you see the transition of the Stutt State Gallery at Stuttgart, the, all the circulation is articulated in bright colors, pink and lime green. That may be the most exuberantly playful of his buildings. I'll be thinking over the next few minutes if something else witty appears to me. Thank you. Um, Chuck is wondering if you could share again the name of the Peruvian architect that you mentioned. Oh yes, that is um, A-L-E-N-H-A-N-D-R-O, Alejandro. Um, he got a Pritzker Prize a few years ago. And um, let's see if I can master my computer to go back. Here he is. Um, Alejandro, A-L-E-J-A-N-D-R-O, Aravena, A-R-A-R-A-V-E-N-A. And if you just type in that name, um, you'll, you'll see him on YouTube. He's very, I don't think he's 50 yet. 
and he 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 is usually in a black t-shirt like I'm wearing or this shirt. It's like these two tops. Very dedicated teacher architect. Thank you. And so John is wondering, uh, one little teaser for part two, January 11th, if you will be talking then at all about his teaching. Uh, Jim's teaching. Um, it's, I hadn't put it in the talk yet. You can see, you know, the office did over 150 projects. So it was very hard for me to edit down to six or eight or 10 to share with you. But I would like to look into some of his teaching and I do have, uh, I have most of his books. Uh, there are statements by his students of what he was good at. I can share with you, um, I do know, he could come up to your uh, desk with the concepts on it. He would take the all in everything you were doing and he would make a little sketch and tell you what thing to pursue to make it a strong, successful, compelling project. He's very, very popular as a teacher. Also, there's these notorious stories of his drinking and uh, behaving rowdily. Uh, but I, I don't think that those type of stories like to follow um, celebrities around a bit. He taught um, Richard Rogers at Yale. He taught Wendy Rogers at Yale and he taught Norman Foster at Yale, among other notables. I'll dig up some stuff and talk a little more about his teaching, maybe have some examples, but he, he was apparently a brilliant popular critic and he worked very hard on it when he was there. More Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Richard says, uh, Nessa, several of his student housing buildings have single loaded corridors and wonders if the issue of efficiency was ever raised with these buildings. Um, they do have single load of card, as you saw that at, um, in a way, uh, the engineering lab has a single load of corridor going up the side of the building. The, um, the Cambridge has a single load of corridor, the library to access the door, the offices, which um, we went so quickly at the Cambridge library, but the party is a, an L shaped building and then there's the glass tent um, I think the overall efficiency of the building just was within budget or he had it within budget and I didn't come across anything where it was challenged. Um, there's an elaborate thing at the St. Andrews where they're not single loaded. You actually go along the edge and then go up or down to double loaded corridors. So it's a good insight. Um, I have got some single loaded stuff in my healthcare work where at the lobby you have lots of daylight, but inevitably you have to go a little bit with double loaded. And I, I will tell some people they should go on the Penn Pavilion website. Um, they did a very good job there trying to have single loaded corridors when you, when you come up and arrive on the floor. So there are views in daylight. Good question. Yeah, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey wants to know if Jim had a predilection for university campus buildings. <laughs> I'm laughing at that. They were the only people that would hire him at the beginning. <laughs> um, universities like to collect architects and buildings like art. They say we should have a, um, well, let's talk about Penn for a minute. We should have a Fumihiko Maki building for the Annenberg Center. We should have a Foster building for the hospital. Um, there, they have usually, in the US, they have deeper pockets and they're not developers. Developers will make you toe the line for cost, square footage analysis. So I think there were academics involved. Uh, there was a very bright engineering young prof as his sponsor for Lester. There was a committee for the library and the librarian was not on that committee. Uh, and at Flory, Dr. Flory had won a Nobel Prize for his work with penicillin. So I think there were those in academia that could, could get it from Jim. Now, some of you may say, 
the, I'm just overwhelmed by the buildings. They are really compelling and striking. I can see the image of that Lester building. Others, it may mean nothing to you, but the clients he had at these buildings, they were really uh, willing to go along with what he wanted to do. So it, it was it, that just, he, he didn't have work for quite a while after what you saw today, only for some work in Germany. Uh, because there were leaks, the, the double glazing, there wasn't double glazing, there wasn't air conditioning. He had asked for air conditioning in all those three buildings and um, only till recently has it been retrofitted in some of them. So I think it's a, a plus for the early British universities, Leicester, Cambridge and Oxford um, were willing to take the risk. And uh, well, I should say, this is a door opening for me. At all, um, in the history of all those buildings, there were threats to tear them down. But they all got listed grade two. That is the highest, most sacred listing. You cannot change the outside or the insides without a very detailed review, much as the Athenaeum is going through. <laughs> to modernize. So um, now, and they have been retrofitted at cost equal to some of their original costs. The initial cost of buildings is just, it's a fraction of their operating costs, you know, for heating and cooling and maintenance servicing. It's amazing that a few percentage points can say, no, we're not having air conditioning, we're not having double glazing, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. So they were threatened with demolition and um, private and public funding came to the rescue to retrofit them. A lot of the tiles that did fall off in some cases have been retrofitted with brick. So they're, they're safe now. Great, one quick final question from Eileen uh, related to this. Uh, did Mrs. Thatcher reach out to Sterling before the decision was made to tear down uh, the buildings that she tore down? She did not. And um, Jim heard about it from a newspaper article and he felt very badly as did his partners. He felt it was a mistake. Um, I think you can judge from yourselves. I think if there had been um, social programs in place, you know, there were no door people or concierges anywhere on that 6,000 person campus. The uh, oil crisis of the early 70s with Jimmy Carter president, you know, the oil prices were tripling and it was a central oil plant. So the residents in each unit had very little control over how much heating or cooling they were doing. They were getting bills no matter what temperature they had set. So Mrs. Mrs. Thatcher uh, did not um, get his okay. Um, mm -hmm. Curiously, um, his wife's family was connected to some of Thatcher's top people. Um, the chancellor of the Shekhar, I believe, was a cousin. So it must have made for lively um, parties at the Sterling House with the two political parties present. <laughs> Good question. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, we'll join with, uh, with Judith in thanking you for, she said, an enchanting peek into Jim Sterling and his work. This was a wonderful talk. We hope you all join us on January 11th for at noon for the next round on Jim Sterling's life. We will be getting that up on our events page and shared out in our e-newsletter e before too long, the link, so you can sign up for that. In the meantime, tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night's program, Patrice Dolan and Lynn Miller is sold out, but next Thursday, you can join us Thursday evening at six in person with uh, Melanie Kirkpatrick to learn more about Sarah Josepha Hale and her fascinating life as an editor and uh, women's rights leader, educator, um, and, uh, and, and, and writer. And um, next Friday night, we have uh, uh, our second of the fall, Allegro Presents Musical uh, Chamber Music Concert. There are still tickets available for that, I believe. And uh, I hope you will join us. And right before Thanksgiving, Monday, November 22nd, will be a special performance with Opera Philadelphia. And so look to our events page, Philadelphia Athenaeum slash events, and sign up and come and join us. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. And remember that the Phil Athenaeum is here for you as a community for all who love arts, architecture, history, literature, and others who share these pursuits to engage in conversation. Wishing you a wonderful afternoon.
Thank I just want to say, if you email yeah. me, if you email me, I have um, a very thorough bibliography. If you want to, and they're available through the Athenaeum, ejackmar at gmail.com or probably Tess, but don't hesitate to email me if you have a burning question or you want to see that I can shoot off the bibliography to you. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.